um, this industry has been perpetuated over time by the um, by the need for secrecy in the 40s and then the assumption of the need for secrecy in the 50s and, and, and thereafter. The, um, the, the term is the atomic priesthood, and it was, it was coined in the 50s or 60s, and uh, I've used it, but it's certainly not my, my term. The, the people that control nuclear power don't want the rest of us to know what's going on, and it dates back to the Manhattan Project. There, there's a bunch of books that uh, talk about the formation of the Atomic Energy Commission, which was the, the founding group. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, and how uh, they deliberately didn't tell the public the truth uh, initially about weapons testing. A great book for anybody who wants to read it is The uh, uh, the Day We Bombed Utah. And it talks about how the Atomic Com- Energy Commission tried to cover up um, exposures to people in Utah, particularly in a town called St. George, from bomb testing. You know, they, this fallout was was. Um, falling all through Utah, people were getting overexposed, and the Atomic Energy Commission went out of its way to downplay the significance of that. So this nuclear priesthood started in the need for secrecy in a weapons program and has continued even to this day. What were the what are the requirements of being part of the nuclear priesthood? Well, um, I was uh, I, I was. Uh, paid to go to college by the Atomic Energy Commission. I was one of 20 Atomic Energy Commission fellows. Um, and, uh, you know, they were basically trying to groom priests, you know, the, to, to get the nuclear degrees so that people would um, uh, would pursue nuclear careers. You know, it, it, there's, a, there's a group in the weapons industry, Department of Energy, and then over in the nuclear industry, and they feel they have the right to uh, to control the technology without any input from uh, from the rest of the American public. The, um, the Congress recognized this problem. You know, the, the the AEC Atomic Energy Commission was doing both bombs and nuclear reactors, and paying for me to go to college. And um, <clears throat> so they were promoting, and they were trying to regulate, and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. So in '76, Congress split them up and created the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. And the theory was that the Nuclear Energy Commission would really regulate. Uh, The only thing Congress didn't do was change the people. So the mindset, the the priesthood mindset that, you know, you and I are are, are, um, not deserving of the the information, was born the very first day the the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was created. Uh, You know, I even see it today. We're, We're... trying to work on um, the San Onofre project out in California. And what happens is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission goes to uh, Southern California Edison, and they pass documents across the table. And when they, after they've read them, they pass those documents back to Southern California Edison. They never, quote, take... These are lawyers. No, these are engineers sitting across the table from each other. Yeah, Mm -hmm. the lawyers have agreed on this process. So they sit in a room and they pass information to the NRC. The NRC reads it and passes it back across the table. And because the NRC never takes possession of the material, it never makes it into the public document room. So they're not required, as long as they don't photocopy these documents, they're not required to make it publicly available, Freedom of Information Act, nothing. None of that applies. None of it applies. And and so the, the priesthood retains its control because outside uh, contractors and outside experts, and believe it or not, there are some outside experts that would like this information available, are, um, are precluded by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission from, uh, from getting our hands on accurate data that might dispute what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission determines. The Chicago pile was 70 years ago today. Why still the need for so much secrecy? I think at this point it's... Uh, it's ingrained in the culture. And um, th- that really gets to the second point uh, that I'm going to be speaking about, and that's the, uh, uh, the enormous subsidies. Uh, we would not have nuclear power, at least in the form we have it now, were it, uh, were it not for the subsidies from the bomb program. I mean, we invested – the Manhattan Project was $2 billion 70 years ago. And it was a lot of money today, and it was a lot more 70 years ago. So all of that infrastructure that we had made for bombs, we then rolled over 
and said, well, let's make some commercial nuclear reactors. The, if you look at all of these subsidies, for 70 years worth of subsidies, they, um, uh, they would add about – they would essentially double the cost of nuclear power. The, the power cost at, at the, as it leaves the power plant, the cost of power from a nuclear plant is around five cents. And Union of Concerned Scientists has said it would be 10 cents had it not been for all these subsidies for 70 years. You know, when you, when you got a kid and then they're in college and you, uh, and you subsidize them and they're 20, that's okay. And when they have tough times in 30 and mom and dad need to subsidize them a little more, you don't want to, but that's okay. But nuclear power is 70 years old and we're still subsidizing it. You know, at some point you got to kick it out and say either make it on your own or don't make it. And we haven't done that with nuclear power. So the idea is then without these subsidies, nuclear power, if left just to the markets, would have failed. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Peter Bradford, from uh, he's from Vermont, but he was a former NRC commissioner, has said that uh, trying to solve global warming uh, by relying on nuclear power plants is like trying to solve glo global hunger by feeding everyone caviar. And he really hits it on the head that this is um, uh, an, an incredibly expensive technology perpetuated by an industry that can't seem to get off the dole. So, Arnie, who subsidized nuclear power in the beginning and who's subsidizing nuclear power today? You know, initially it was um, the Department of, of, of War, we called it at the time, the Department of Defense. And... Um, uh, over time, it became the, uh, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission. And then for the last 20 or 30 years, it's become the Department of Energy. The, the biggest proponent of nuclear power in the, in the federal government right now is, uh, is huge subsidies coming through the Department of Energy. They just announced another half a billion dollar subsidy for uh, small modular reactors, little reactors now. Um, ten years ago, they were pushing huge reactors like the ones we're building in, in um, Vogel, at the Vogel plant in Georgia. You know, they said, well, we need these big plants because they're safe. And now they've decided we need small plants because they're safe, but we're still building the big ones with, a, with taxpayer guarantees. You know, it's, it starts with Congress, though. If, if um, the industry has, has its claws into Congress, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, the industry has its claws into Congress. And Unless we get our congressmen to, um, uh, to change and to, uh, to say, wouldn't this money be better spent balancing the budget? If we did that, uh, I think that uh, we can begin to change this, uh, this industry. But right now, it's, uh, it's really got its hooks into Congress.